So good afternoon everyone and thank you for tuning in to our monthly webinar where we talk through many topics ranging from educational webinars that aim to update our clients and farmers on new features and products we have launched or busy developing to focus webinars that dive into the nitty gritty parts about farming and the challenges that are being faced by, by farmers and the industries out there. So today we have two special guests that have joined us. The first is Professor Stephanie Mitchley, who is sitting next to me right now. Uh, she is a researcher and project manager in agriculture, food security and climate change. She holds a PhD in botany and a master's degree in horticultural science. And she has worked on climate change impact, vulnerability and adaption since 1992. Stephanie, it's great to have you in, in with us this afternoon. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Thanks. Okay, so our second guest is Dr. Almi Lotta, who has a PhD in horticulture and has a strong research focus on fruit quality, particularly fruit size of apples, and has investigated the impact of various environmental factors like winter chilling and spring temperatures on fruit size. Her latest research focus has adapted three key areas, which are plant nutrition, climate, and root growth dynamics. Almi is dialing in from Stellenbosch University. So Almi, I hope you can hear us, and it's great to have you here too. So before I jump right in, I just want to mention that after the webinar, we will have a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions during the duration of the webinar for Professor Mijli or Dr. Lotz, please post them in the comment section below, and we'll address them at the end of the, of the webinar. So today's discussion is all about apples. Uh, and who better to talk to than a professor and a doctor who are both specializing in the area. Um, so Professor Stephanie, I've given you a brief introduction, but could you maybe give us a background of how you got to where you are today and what you're currently working on? Okay, well, <laughs> I got to where I am is a long story, so I won't, I won't bore everybody with the, you know, 30 years of development, okay. but um, basically I, I studied botany and biochemistry with the idea of becoming a plant physiologist, which is what I am now. Gave me a good grounding, but then I went into an applied science, um, and specifically horticultural science, and I've worked on um, apples mainly, but also pears, um, and also my master's was on, on stone fruit, on, on nectarines. Um, I then also, I took some time off and I went to work for a consultancy in Cape Town working on climate change and agriculture in, in more general terms and development across southern Africa. Um, I broadened my perspective quite a bit around issues of food security and uh, impacts of climate change and, and what that means for, for farmers on the ground. And I've worked with farmers of all sizes, all the way from subsistence agriculture, Lesotho, Mozambique, to back now with the big commercial guys um, in the Western Cape. So that's given me quite a large, you know, nice perspective on the, you know, the whole scene. So, yeah, um, the work I do is focuses very much on climate risk um, and climate, is especially influences on, on production um, of fruit and, um, and quality. And so I worked for a long time around uh, sunburn, what, what happens when sunburn develops on fruit. Um, which is what you know what what is the problem and then physiologically what happens and then particularly the technologies that can be applied by farmers to combat sunburn. And I've also worked on color development which is also linked very strongly to climate. You know high temperatures are, are very negative for red color development in, in most uh, fruit. Um, yeah at the moment I'm focusing still looking very much at production and quality but with a more specific focus on water use um, and um, water use in the tree and then quantify quite, quite accurately how much water is actually used in an apple tree and what are the factors that, that drive how much water is used and then what can farmers do to become more water use efficient. Yeah. So great, I mean it's clear that you've got quite a strong academic background behind all the projects that you're working on and I think it's really important especially now in the Western Cape since we've been going through all the droughts, I mean it's super important that this is studied because um, you know, droughts are going to be happening more frequently in the future, so it's good that there is someone out there preparing the farmers for it, so that's great to hear. Um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, sunburn, because we know sunburn is a hot topic at the moment, excuse the pun, um, but many farmers are battling with it. And so canopy dense density has a big impact on the quality of fruits. Uh, if the canopy is too dense, then you know, the farmers struggle to get the color of the apples. 
but when it's too thin, then we start to see sunburn present itself on the apples. So how is this affecting growers at the moment? And are growers relying more and more consult on consultants for advice? Yes, um, so it's a catch-22, how you manage your, your tree size in relation to, to fruit quality. Um, you obviously want the fruit numbers on your tree, but um, it's, it's actually more around the efficiency of, of it's, you know, the, the relationship between the number of fruit and, and the vegetative growth. So you want your, your energy, your carbon to go into fruit rather than just to grow you know, shoots and, and you know, the vegetative side. So, but the problem is that if you, if you have a big canopy in apple production, especially with the red cultivars, you lose out on the quality and you don't get the, the color development. So all the nice red apples are on the outside because they need light. Um, and if there's a lack of light towards the inside, then you don't get the color development. So the growers of, with the much more intensive plantations now, where you have very narrow spacings, uh, much smaller trees, and people starting to really try to get the tree smaller and smaller and smaller using you know, dwarfing rootstocks, reducing vegetative vigor, um, and then having the apples on the outside, almost like, like a wall like they do in Europe, um, and nicely exposed to sunlight, you get good red color development. But the downside of that is that you run the high risk in our climate when on a very hot day in a, in a heat wave of, of getting sunburn. And we have very high levels of sunburn in South Africa on our apples, um, you know, compared to you know, global production areas. So it's, it's been a problem for a very long time, but the fact that the trees are getting smaller, um, and the apples are more exposed. Um, you know, there's a debate around whether the fruit actually become used to the high light and the high temperatures, and it makes them more resilient to and, and not develop the sunburn as much. What we know is that if a fruit has been in low light during its development and is then suddenly exposed to high light and high temperature, it will get sunburn. Okay. Um, so, but but some of our top farmers are using, you know, incredible production, you know, tools now to to manage canopy size and vigor and still get very good. Um, quality and, and pack out. So, yeah, I think it's, it's tricky. It is really tricky to get that balance right. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe let's let's talk about a bit about nets and drape nets. I mean, we're seeing a lot of farmers now putting up nets and putting up the drape nets, which is obviously a huge cost to them. Um, so, do the nets play a big role in preventing sunburn? Um, I know we know there has a lot of other benefits that come along with it, but are farmers putting these nets up specifically for sunburn, mm -hmm. or is there another reason for, reasoning for it? Okay, so in the Western Cape, our farmers are primarily putting up uh, nets to reduce sunburn. That that is, yeah. Um, if we look at the production areas in the Orange Free State, one of the main reasons is hail, hail protection, um, with the added benefit of sunburn reduction. But the main focus is hail. But in the Western Cape, it's sunburn. And also um, on the, um, the, the, the green cultivars like Granny Smith, we sometimes have very pale green color. Um, and reducing the direct sunlight using netting actually brings out the, the, the green color in Granny Smith. And the value of the product is, is significantly increased. And we get better packouts, better export um, um, you know, percentages just because of the better, better green color. So those are the main reasons. And then some people are using it with the young plantings, um, they put it up together with the, when they plant the young trees, uh, it increases the vigor, the growth of the trees and gets them into production more quickly. And some farmers are saying that it uh, reduces the time into full production by up to a year, sometimes wow. sometimes longer. That's amazing. Yeah. So I mean, us at Aerobotics, we're always getting asked about, about nets. Um, I mean, we, we're an imagery company, so you know, the question has come up quite a bit as to whether our drone imagery can see through nets. And I know, I mean, you've had some, a bit of experience with drone imagery. Um, you're working on some trial sites where you've, you've put a drone up and you've got aerial imagery of those, those trial blocks. So in your opinion, the farmers with nets, do you think there's value to be added through drone imagery? Um, I think there's a lot of value to be added, and not just because of sunburn, but um, if, I don't know of any applications at the moment where where drones are being used to try and understand you know, what the damage is. Um, I think it would be fantastic to, to have such a product. And I think it would be you know, very widely used in terms of trying to quantify what's happening in the orchard before yeah. you get to the harvest. Um, um, yeah, but, but farmers are using drones. You know, I think what, one of the problems under netting is that the, the vigor of the trees is, is stronger. So they, they, they grow much, much more strongly vegetatively and it becomes 
it can become a bit of a problem to manage that. Um, and so what would be useful to see is, is, is you know, how big the trees are getting, the, 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 the height and the canopy volume, um, and, um, and then trying to adjust the management practices around, you know, managing that, the tree size uh, optimally, and, you, and then, you know, using drone technology to see if, if you're getting it right. Um, okay. yeah. All right, so, I mean, this leads me to my next question. Regardless of nets and no nets, how do you see technology, you know, making a difference on apple farms in the future? Um, I think some of the applications are, are already being used, for example, tree health, and I think you guys are doing that, um, nutrition, and you know, those are established um, applications. I think where we don't have the applications yet, and which would be incredibly useful, is for much more accurate um, crop estimates. Um, and through, the, through the season, so for planning purposes. So at the moment, it's the methods that are used for crop estimates are, are not terribly accurate, and sometimes the farmers get it wrong. And in terms of you know the marketing departments, the pack houses want to be able to plan ahead yeah, and to get a much more accurate estimate of what your crop's going to be, um, and possibly even dividing it into what you think is going to be your export percentage versus your class three or your your cull. Exactly. I mean, and if you could identify, you know, if what level of, for example, cull there is with sunburn or, or bigger, other bigger blemishes on the fruit that you might be able to pick up using drone, drone technology. Yeah, that yes. would be an amazing application yes, to uh, help farmers see what's going to happen at home. For sure, for yeah. sure. I think let's just to take a step back. You talked, you spoke about the different classes of fruit grading now. Um, but for, for maybe for the listeners that don't really have a clear understanding, could you maybe explain to them what you mean in terms of yield estimates and how farmers are actually doing the yield estimates at the moment? And maybe we can have a chat about what the different class um, classes mean mm -hmm. for food quality. So I think there are various ways of doing yield estimates, and maybe this is where Elmi can also come in. Um, she's quite experienced on this as well. Um, Elmi, you want to shout if you want to join? Yeah, Elmi, please. <laughs> um, but as the, the main method is still very much manually. You go, you do go to some representative trees, and you literally strip the tree, and you figure out how many fruit there are on the tree, what what kind of size you've got, what kind of mass you're going to have per tree. So very much, it's a very, uh, um, you have to be, you know, just a small portion of the trees that you can do this with. Um, and and it's, it's time intensive and it's really, yeah, it's, it's not optimal. Um, there are some people trying to develop technologies of, you know, with, with robots moving through the rows yeah. and trying to pick up how many fruit they are on a given, in a given, you know, space. Yes, yes. Um, but that, all that is not really being used commercially yet. Um, but if one could have a, a, an estimate based on the whole, the whole block, not just selected trees, um, and it was, it was much more accurate than what you did if you know, do it manually, then that, that could be very useful. Yeah, so I mean, um, as you said, the farmers go to a, a couple of trees in, on the farm or in the orchard, so what you're saying is we kind of need to go to a lot more locations and do a lot more sampling of the different trees in order to get more accurate. Yes, so if you want to be more accurate, you have to get more samples, is the rule of statistics. But um, farmers don't have the time for that. They also don't want to strip their trees unnecessarily before pre harvest. Um, and it's, it's labor intensive and it's just wasteful. Um, and so it's, it's not optimal. Sometimes farmers will just eyeball what's, yeah. what's on the tree, you know, walk down, walk down through the blocks. And, and some people are very experienced at, at getting it fairly right, and others aren't. Um, but it's it's a bit of a hit and miss to some extent, and people get it wrong, and then it has big implications for the pack houses, for you know managing your your harvest logistics or labour, you know where are your resources going, and then what happens in the pack house, and, and eventually the planning for the marketing, you know how much do you think is going to go for export yeah. or to the juice factory or whatever. You know. All right, no great. I mean I love the topic of yield, and I think I could talk for hours about it, but I'm going to change the subject a little bit now and talk about pests and diseases. Uh, I'm sure for anyone who's been on a road trip out of Cape Town or into Cape Town in the past Robo in the Alden area, they'll see a big signboard saying a fruit fly management zone. So maybe we can just have a chat about that and for the listeners that don't really understand why it's there or what it means, could you, could you explain that to them? Well, firstly, I'm not, I'm not a pest <laughs> expert, yeah, no, course, but yeah, yeah. Um, really fruit fly is one of our major pests that causes immense damage. Um, it's it's not a it's not a it doesn't belong in the Western Cape and it's it's a wall bite issue. It causes yeah. huge damage. So, the, quite a long time ago already, the Western Cape uh, or the fruit industry started a research project and it's it's actually commercialised now, where they've uh, they're using technologies uh, around mating dis disruption yeah. um, and so on to um, and then they release these sterile flies basically into an area, 
um, and that wipes out the population okay. over a certain period of time. Um, and this is now being done commercially, and uh, that's why you see those. It's, it, it's in certain areas, it's not everywhere, and in those areas, and they're usually quite enclosed areas like the Hicks River Valley, you, know, you can kind of monitor what's going on inside that valley. Um, and it's, it's been very, very effective. Um, and it's, 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 it was expensive getting it developed, and um, but now it's up and running. Um, but you know, to maintain the investment in yeah. that is it's, it's quite a big investment. Um, but it does work. But it's the only one at that scale really that, that is being commercialized. I mean, basically farmers use um, a lot of monitoring um, and just picking up very quickly if there's something that's that's starting to flourish yeah. in the orchards and, and managing it um, using the tools they have. Yeah, I think monitoring is the key. I mean, that's uh, scouting essentially is. The base of, of agriculture. I mean, you've got to be out in the field scouting for for pests and diseases because uh, it's important to pick it up as soon as they get in to Absolutely. make sure that they don't affect your, your final pack out. So, I mean, on that note, could you maybe give us an idea of what percentage of yield is lost every season due to pest and disease damage, and for that case, sunburn, um, and how is technology playing a role in decreasing this number? Well, it it, it really varies widely from year to year. Um, but we found that for sunburn specifically, um, we quite often get 20 to 30 percent sunburn um, on, on, on the crop. Sure. Um, and there's a very, very low tolerance on the export market. Um, with a very, very slight yellowing is still acceptable. What we, in our categorization, we have a zero, which is no sunburn, and then a one, which is very, very slight. You can still export that. Some markets are stricter than others, but generally when you get to a slightly more browner area, then it immediately becomes local market. You can't export it in your price plummets. Um, and so, yeah, so we're getting uh, quite, some of our coal, you know, due to very serious sunburn, the coals are sometimes over 10% of, sure. of the crop. And that is really the stuff that gets thrown away. It can't even be juiced to some extent, some of it. Um, so it's, it's one of the most significant problems that we have in the Western Cape in terms of loss of, loss of crop and loss of income. Um, and then when it comes to pests and diseases, it really depends very much on how well the farmer is managing the integrated pest management program on, in the block on the farm. Um, and if it's done well according to best practice, then really it should be quite low. Okay. Um, but obviously there are seasons where certain things pop out and you know, it's just, you, you can't manage it the way you want it to. And then you can get damage, of, you know, yeah, I, I hesitate hate to give figures because it depends on the pest and on the year and so on. But it, it can make, it can make a difference um, to your to your income. Right. Yeah. And um, you said uh, the ten percent culling in terms of the fruit that's lost at the end of the season. Yeah. I mean, for the viewers listening, can you maybe give them an indication, like in terms of you know, ten percent is quite a lot, but in terms of apple yield uh, on a tons per hectare or cost mm -hmm. perspective, how much is that really? Well, average, but you could have made a lot more. Yeah. And it's it's really a total waste. Um, you know, I mean, in, in many of our comp competing you know countries around the world that are the, you know the big apple producers and exporters, that would be completely unacceptable. The kind of rates that we get, that the you know, apples are lost. So on a hundred tons per hectare, if you're getting ten percent coal, that that's a massive, that's a lot of apples. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's also that that trade-off between pushing those very high yields and but making sure that your quality the pack out still yeah. are excellent and keep improving and that's that's tricky and, yeah. yeah no for sure definitely well i mean you know lots of people out there realize they don't realize the hard work behind the agriculture so i think it's really important that we have these discussions and we, you know we get everyone involved in the discussions and try and get them to to give us suggestions and ideas of ways to, to help us combat so it's really important that we have, we have people like you that are studying and researching and trying to improve the way we farm, which is, is I think, is super important. All right, so this brings me to my final question for you, um, Professor Mishi, which, let's say, hypothetically now, we were able to get a percentage yield loss um, due to pest and disease in terms of quality, but also provide farmers with an accurate yield estimate before harvest in terms of fruit counts, but also fruit sizing. What are the implications to the industry and how will this shape the future of farming? Well, the, the, the overall effect of all of that is better net income. Um, and that's what everybody's striving towards. And there are a lot of farmers who are not, not breaking even 
in the way that they could or should um, to be profitable uh, and are really on the margins of profitability. And if we could just shift them into the, onto the next level of, of better yields, better pack out, which means better, you know, better quality, uh, meeting the, the demands of the, of the very fussy export markets and consumers. So if, if even just a slight increase, uh, uh, you know, a few percent, if you're getting your apples from a local market classification, even if it's just a portion of your apples, in, you know, putting, pushing that into your export categorization, it makes a massive difference to your, to your net income because your costs remain the same. Your costs are the same, whether it's going to the juice factory or whether it's going to the Cape Town market or, yeah. or overseas. So you have to recoup your costs first and foremost, and then you want to make profit. Yeah. So um, that, that is the main purpose of most commercial farms, is to keep on pushing pushing that, that breakdown into the, you know, into the ex export market. Uh, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. So, I mean, a lot of farmers um, have started using technologies on the farm, mm -hmm. and a lot of them still unsure about it, but we are seeing a lot more converting to the application of, of technology. So how do you see, since, since all the technology that's been brought to the farm, how do you see farming improving? How, where do you see it going? Well, I think a lot of people are still not doing the monitoring that they should be doing, um, and the data collection and the record keeping, and, and just understanding, quantifying what's actually happening, yeah. and analyzing it, because they're just not getting the data in. Um, they can see it at the end of the year that, oh my goodness, we didn't make the profit we hoped to, but there's, there's not enough monitoring. And I think technology can really, really help um, make monitoring cheaper, quicker, less labor intensive. Um, and then together with, as you said, together with scouting, knowing what it is you're monitoring, obviously exactly. identifying what the issues are, but you can be much more precise around, you know, understanding where the issues are and then identifying yeah. and quickly understanding, you know, seeing it very quickly and being able to deal with it maybe before it becomes a big issue. Yeah. Um, so I think just just using technology to, to make your work easier yeah. and in the end, you know, just get a better harvest off your yeah, tree. Because sure. you've been, and you can be more proactive as you, if, you, if you're using it on a regular basis through the season and uh, analyzing it. Um, and that, that I think is where it would be nice to have tools that almost help you to interpret as you go along. To have um, like another farmer in the field with you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and tell you, okay, well, there's a problem, but we're helping you to interpret it, and then you make the decisions how you want to deal with it. But we're making your life easier by, by telling you where and, and what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that, that would be amazing. Yeah, so I completely, completely agree with you. Technology is helping farmers to improve the way they monitor their farms. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to scouting, we still see a lot of farmers uh, are not really scouting. Um, a lot of them, you know, they don't think it's very important. Some of them think it's very, very important, but we still have some that, as you say, are just walking through the fields and looking around. I mean, what would you have to say to those, to those type of farmers? Well, you, you've got to have a purpose. You've got to understand why you're walking around, what you're looking for, and how to interpret that, and who to go to if, if you pick up something and you're not sure what it is, but you think it's going to have a, an impact on, on your bottom line. Um, or, yeah, if you, I think farmers do know that if you catch something early on, um, it's better to, to deal with it then than to let it become a huge, a huge problem that we have to then cost, put a lot of money into to deal with it. Um, yeah, I think people are just pressed for time. And you, I think you've got to have, a, a, as I say, a plan, a, a reason, a purpose, and then know what to do when you, when you do think that you've picked something up and you're not sure what it is. And someone to help you um, with it. Yeah, with, with, there are all sorts of consultants, depending on what it is, who, who can help you with that. And then you, it's your decision at the end of the day what, how you want to respond. Yeah. And you can say, okay, well, I don't think it's going to make a big difference to my bottom line. We'll you know, not put a lot of effort into it. Or, or you can be helped with a decision that this is really something I need to deal with very quickly. Yeah. All right, great. All right, so on that note, I'd just like to thank you for joining us, Professor. Uh, it's been great to have you, and I'm sure our listeners have learned a lot from what you've had to, to say. So thank you, and all the best for your future studies, and we really hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A uh, section, and we'll get around to asking, to asking them. All right, so we've got a question from an anonymous attendee. So in a year um, where the availability of water is low, is there a way you can cut water without putting too much stress on the tree 
uh, taking into account that you put on a smaller yield. Okay, um, I think in the drought a lot of lessons were learned. Um, farmers who did have water allocation cuts tried various things uh, to try and use the little water they had productively, uh, more efficiently. So a lot of lessons were learned and, and there, are, there are things that, that really do work. Um, it's, it's the kind of irrigation system that you're using. Um, I know it's not always easy to quickly change from a, say, a micro system to a drip system, but we know that drip, drip uses less water and you can put the same crop on and, and use less water using, using drip. Um, putting a mulch is absolutely essential, even without the drought, and everybody should be using mulches now to, to reduce water losses through evaporation. Um, yeah, and then keeping your, your leaf canopy, um, if you're reducing the, the leaf canopy, because that is where your water is lost through the tree. Yeah. Um, and you know, matching that with your, with your crop size as well. Just keeping the trees a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit less fruit, um, and that way you can you can still have a crop uh, but using a lot less water. Right. Uh, those are some of the things that people tried and, and it, it did work. Um, and just being more, maybe irrigating less often, um, but then deeply so the water runs into the deeper soil layers um, and um, you know that way or, or irrigating at night so you're getting a lot less evaporation yes, losses. Yes. That, that's another one. All right, so I just see we've got a comment coming through from Dr. Almi Lotz, and her comment is that you can also concentrate your water you have into the critical periods. Uh, what is your comment on that? Yes, you, you, if you understand your crop, and you know that there's certain periods in your crop phenology which are more sensitive to your water deficit than others, uh, you can make sure that your trees is getting enough water during that period um, and they may be cut at another time when you know when the crop is off the tree, for example, or um, you know. But obviously, being careful not not to stress the trees necessarily. But but you can use the water you have at, at certain critical times to make sure um, that there is no stress in the tree. Um, or for example, when we know that if, if trees are drought stressed, they are more likely to develop sunburn than other fruit. Um, and so, if you know that there's a heat wave coming, uh, making sure that your your sensitive cultivars that you know might be getting sunburn, make sure that they, they well watered during that particular week um, and then you can maybe remove it again the week after. All right, uh, we've got another question from Ian Cunningham and he, he's asking, are there any studies relating to bud quality within the tree canopy after repeated use of dragnet year after year, which is reducing light intensity? Does this have an impact on cell division and bud development? Yes, that's, that's actually a very important concern around netting um, and there's not a lot of data yet. There's, the research hasn't really been done, but farmers who have been using netting over a few seasons, um, also in South Africa but also overseas, some of them do report that they're getting fewer buds over, over time, it progressively uh, fewer or weaker buds and it's affecting their, their, their set and, and their cropping. Um, but it's it's you know we, we don't know how you know we really don't have a lot of data around that. It is a concern. Um, but with drag netting, the, what's good about drag netting is you can remove it during critical times. So after harvest, you remove the netting, and then when, when the, at that time when the buds are still developing, um, you can make sure that they're getting enough light um, for that you know the post harvest uh, bud development that, that occurs, and then also in the in the in the spring. You only put the drag netting on once your fruit set has been, been finalized. Um, and so, and then they, with the fixed netting, people are using systems that you can open up. So at a critical time when, when there's you know, bud initiation, bud development, you can, and you can make a decision. You want to, you want to open it up and let, let the sun into, you know, for, for the bud development. Yeah, so it's a question of managing it. We, we do think that, that there are maybe risks under netting of, you know, the reproductive side for the next season, but um, it's something I think just needs to be monitored. Um, okay. yeah. Maybe a topic for another research proposal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So we've got one more question um, from John, and his question is, what is important to monitor for, and what dates are, what kind of dates are we talking about? Well, I think the, the critical monitoring is always pests and diseases. Um, the other one is water, um, and people are if people aren't monitoring irrigation carefully, you know, what is, you know, using technology that is available, sensors um, in, in, in the soil, 
possibly even there's new technology coming out for actually sensing what's going on in the tree. So you've got a tree-based measurement of plant uh, water potential or the, the tree stress. Um, monitoring your climate, you know, understanding how you know, the water in the soil, the tree, the, the atmosphere, how that works and how it affects your, your tree stress. And then knowing how, you know, most, you know, in terms of precision agriculture, you know, being much more precise around giving only exactly what the tree needs and not, not being wasteful. Um, making sure you're not over watering because that also stresses the tree. And it, it actually reduces, um, it can re reduce cropping and profitability and the quality, uh, or under or under irrigating. So there's a lot of instances where people are not um, getting it right yet in, in in fruit production, and it's because you, you can get better at it just by, by better monitoring and use of technology. Great. Uh, on that note, I'd just like to thank you, uh, Professor Mitchell, for joining us today. Um, it's been really great to have you, and I hope we can we can do this again some some very soon. Thanks. Thanks uh, very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Um, for all the listeners and viewers that are that are that have dialed in, we'd just like to let you know that you can rewatch this this webinar on Facebook. It will be posted onto the Aerobotics Facebook page. And if you have any suggestions or comments about new products and features or webinar topics for the future, please post them in the comment section on Facebook or or now. Uh, or you can email us at support at uh, So thank you everyone for tuning in and we look forward to the next one.